Last year, when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789% in Overstock before it shot up over 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. And right now you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to powergagetrial.com for your free look. Again, that's powergagetrial.com for your free look. All right, let's get to our segment today. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni, and welcome back to Stansberry Research. Back with us today is Alf Picatiello. He is the author of The Macro Compass. Also, he's a former head of a $20 billion investment for portfolio. Alf, always good to be with you. Welcome back to the show. Daniela, pleasure to be on Stansberry Research the whole time. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I read with great interest your latest report uh, where you basically say, look, Folks, uh, you're not going to sugarcoat it. These are absolutely troubled times, um, but you're looking at certain indicators, polar, store, polar stars, what you call them, to help navigate uh, these troubled waters. So lots of uh, talking points with you today, Alf. But first, I want to start with something that you recently tweeted about the bloodbath uh, that we're seeing in the NASDAQ, yet you say uh, bond yields you know, down uh, 10 basis points here. It's basically telling us everything we need to know. So if we read between the lines, what should we be expecting next? Well, Daniela, basically what's happening is that markets are adjusting to the growth scare, which seems to be ahead of us. And we're having bond deals trying to reprice down. So signaling the Federal Reserve can't be as aggressive as they told us they will be because the economy is slowing down. But now normally when bond deals drop, People are used to think this is positive for the Nasdaq, it's positive for Katie's, Katie Wood's ARK, positive for Bitcoin. In reality, we are seeing the opposite. We are seeing days where bond yields drop and the equity market, especially the tech names, also drop aggressively. And that's why I tweeted on my profile at MacroAlf, it's the handle on Twitter, that you know we are seeing risk premium widening, which is also one of my polar stars highlighted on the report at the Macro Compass. It is a measure of equity risk premium. So investors want to be compensated more to own risky stuff right now. Okay, let's take that a little step further because, you know, to that point, I just want to understand more why this isn't benefiting the risk assets. Yeah, so effectively you can uh, think of investors always having a choice. They don't start from zero, but they start from a deposit in a bank account. That is the, the most common form of money we have today, a digital deposit in a, in, a, in a bank account, right? And that yields nothing, basically nothing. And, and you run some risks that your bank is going to default, especially if your deposit is above $250,000 in the US, it's not insured by the government, right? So your money is a liability of a commercial bank. Now, so what you do then is your alter risk-free alternative is to buy treasury bonds. Treasury bonds are a liability of the government. It's somehow safer than a commercial bank deposit, right? And so you also sometimes get some yields on treasuries that are higher than a commercial bank deposit. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is your benchmark, then you tend to measure every other riskier investment compared to that. You measure a corporate bond compared to a treasury bond, or you measure an equity investment compared to the return you can make on a treasury bond. And that is why in my measure of the equity risk premium, I compare the earning yield, so this is, this is the reverse of the PE, basically. So the yield that you would get by investing in an equity against the yield, inflation adjusted, you would receive by investing in a treasury bond. And right now, even if treasury are, treasuries are dropping, this is not benefiting the earnings yield on, on um, tech stocks. So mm -hmm. the valuations of, this, of these equities are not getting higher. So people are demanding a higher risk premium. And why is that? because the Federal Reserve has been very clear with us that they do want financial conditions to tighten. They want credit spreads to widen. They want valuations to shrink. They want our animal spirits to slow down so that they can also slow down inflation. Okay, a, a lot of good points here, okay? So what's it gonna take and how long will it take for the tech sector to thir turn things around here? So effectively, uh, Daniel, I calculated that uh, we have wiped out $25 trillion in market cap amongst equities, bonds, and crypto year to date. 
25 trillion dollars. That has been a massive drawdown in everything you own. There was basically no place to hide. And why is that? Mostly because at the same time, the economy is slowing down. So we are still growing, but the impulse of growth has come down compared to 2021. And central banks are becoming very nervous about inflation. Now, what will it take for equities to actually start to rebound more significantly? It will take one of these two things. Yeah. Either earnings and economic growth picks up, but I can't see that happening because yeah. the private sector is under pressure, higher borrowing rates. You can see already even in the housing market, some slowdown. Yeah. Or it will take the Federal Reserve to say, wait a second, I think I've done enough damage to the demand side of the equation. Inflation is slowing down. I can take my foot off the gas pedal. Okay. Okay, let's explore that further, uh, because I believe the last time we, we were speaking, uh, you were saying that the Fed will, will keep tightening. But, I mean, what are the chances that we would really see a reversal and that they would go back uh, to, to, you know, printing money QE? Yeah, so it's all about inflation at this stage. And I want the audience at Stansberg Research to understand that it's not enough for inflation to slow down. We all hope it slows down, for God's sake, we're at 8.5% in America. We hope it slows down, but it is the pace of deceleration that matters. The Federal Reserve projects inflation to slow down to 4% by year end, and markets are, slowing, are projecting a slowdown to 45 to 5%. Now, if inflation slows down, at least at that pace, Daniela, or more than that, then the Federal Reserve can say, you know what, I think I've done enough damage, I can actually you know, slow down. And then the market can, you know, take again these animal spirits. But if we slow down less than that, what are they going to do? They'll, ha they'll have to be more aggressive. They'll have to convince us. They'll have to make us lower our inflation expectation and go even harsher. So it's all about inflation right now. What, what I mean, we saw the numbers, uh, you know, dip slightly in April for inflation. Do you think we've, we've hit peak inflation? What are your personal thoughts on where we are at with the inflation curve? So I, I put up a chart, it's on uh, core services inflation. And I want the audience again to understand there are different components in the inflation of basket. Course. So the durable goods, the stuff that during the pandemic got bought a lot because we got a lot of fiscal stimulus, our purchasing power went up because the government transferred a lot of money to Americans' bank account and also in Europe and in Canada. We went out and bought goods. And so good prices went up very aggressively. There was a scarcity in supply too, et cetera, et cetera. The services part, the sticky part of the inflation basket, Daniela, that didn't really go up that fast. And now we are seeing the stickier part, core services inflation, pick up to the fastest pace since the 1990s. That is the part that is the stickiest. It's the most difficult to bring down again. And now we are seeing an uptick in that. So yeah, year on year numbers. Okay, sure, we, we probably are gonna be a slowdown up from 8% to somewhere lower. Yeah. But what matters is two things the month-on-month -month numbers, because they are less volatile compared to the, a year ago where all these base effects were on. And the second thing that matters is the composition of the slowdown. Durable goods, if they slow down, yeah, of course, we understand why. But if the sticky part of the inflation basket, the rents, the services inflation, if that goes up and remains higher, it's not going to be easy for the Fed to say, well, we're happy with it, right? Right, absolutely. And let's add a third element to this equation. I'm curious to know how you think the China lockdowns will play into the inflation numbers. How much of an impact yeah. is that having? Well, of course, they're going to tighten the supply chain even further. I mean, China is the place where we produce most things. The business model of Western democracies over the last 30 years has been to outsource production to where it was the cheapest and then hope that the supply chain works. So the production of these of this goods is very cheap because wages in China and Vietnam, etc., are much lower than in the West. And then make sure that we have on-time delivery for all the pieces we need of semiconductor chips that we need in everything we use, medical devices, computers, etc. And now we have the largest, one of the largest ports in China, which is basically stuck. And I posted a chart on, on the Macro Compass that showed that the number of ships that are waiting to discharge or to load at the port of Shanghai is three times larger than at any point in time at the similar month in a similar year. Mm -hmm. So we're having a backlog, of course. And if we can't get things to produce what we need, then obviously producer prices are going to go up and some of those are going to be transferred into consumer prices. So that doesn't help at all the picture. I uh, want to bring up the credit spreads, which you mentioned earlier, and I don't think this is getting enough attention because you, you have written that they are blowing up and we're basically heading towards you know what you call 2016 global growth scare levels. Talk to us yeah. about this and, and what you know how does this impact us directly? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Daniela. So this is basically one of the least observed metrics in markets and one of the most important. So what I posted on the Macro Compass is a chart of five-year junk credit spreads in the US. And for junk, I mean companies that are rated below investment grade. So this is, you know, the weakest links, let's say, in corporate America. And those are the credit spreads, are the spreads they pay on top of treasury yields to fund their businesses, to issue bonds, basically, in the market, right? And these spreads have moved from 300 basis points to 520 basis points in the manner of a few months. Now, in 2018, last time they moved so hard and they overcome the 500 basis point mark, the Federal Reserve stepped in. It was late 2018, and you remember Powell said, Sorry, um, all this uh, new uh, hiking all the way through, we have to stop that, we'll have to pivot, we'll have to be dovish. And so people are telling me, well, Alf, this is the moment. It's above 500 basis point. They'll have to step in. They'll have to help the credit market. Right. They can't. The main difference, it's also visualized in another chart I post, it's the inflation expectation distribution. In 2018, inflation was at 2%, and everybody was expecting inflation to be at 2% for the next five years. So the Federal Reserve was like, well, I have things under control. You know, everybody expects 2%. If things go really bad in the credit market, I can intervene. Nowadays, the same inflation distribution points to a median outcome of 3.5% for the next five years, Daniela. That's vastly higher than the Federal Reserve target. So how can they credibly intervene to rescue markets if people are expecting inflation to be 3.5%? They have to be credible on the inflation fighting front. That is the main difference. They cannot rescue markets. The Fed put is not here. They are not in the conditions to apply one. Okay, so if they can't rescue the market, what happens? Ah, credit spreads just continue to widen. It is very simple. I mean, um, credit spreads, you asked me that before, are important because they dictate how much us, not our government, but us, the private sector, has to pay to borrow. And so this is corporates, but this is also mortgages. If you look at mortgage rates, Daniela, yeah. they've gone higher much faster then treasury yields have gone higher. And so we as citizens to purchase a house are getting hammered in terms mm -hmm. of, of borrowing costs. So when we, do, when we receive that treatment and borrowing is not cheap anymore, what do we do? It's pretty simple. We don't borrow anymore. Right. When we don't borrow anymore, we have less purchasing power. We have less uh, buoyant economic activity. This is exactly what the Federal Reserve is looking for to slow down the economy. So they will not intervene to ease things down unless inflation is really slowing down. So right now, having the right colon inflation is pivotal to have the right asset allocation going forward. Let's take it one step fur further then. So then would we see housing costs come down with the bubble burst there? Yeah, we are seeing already the first signs, Daniela, that the housing market is slowing down. So you see bidding wars in America that are on the same house coming down. So the percentage of houses that is subject to a bidding war is coming down. For the first time in a while, you see the inventory of housing actually picking up. So those are houses that are coming to the market against the demand, which is slowing down. And why it is slowing down, Daniel? It's very simple. The monthly mortgage cost, mortgage installment, on the median US house is 45% higher than a year ago. Salaries, on the other hand, are not 45% higher. No, actually, they have not moved. <laughs> my salary is not 45% higher. I don't know about you guys. But actually, in inflation-adjusted uh, um, levels, it's lower because wages have gone up, but inflation has gone up faster. And energy bills have gone up too. So when I look at how much a, a US guy, but a Canadian guy, a European guy can afford to pay out of his monthly disposable income, is less than a year ago. And the mortgage installment is 45% higher. So it's very simple. This is not an equilibrium stage. People can't afford to buy the median house in most places anymore. So what happens? Well, prices have to stop going up at the very least. Actually, I would argue they'll have to go down a bit from here. Or what happens is that foreign investors just keep buying the property. That also might be true. But foreign investors, do not forget that. So I, I worked for... a. Uh, I managed a large, a large fund, $20 billion. And what, when we look at global macro opportunities around the globe, Daniela, what we used to do is we looked at our benchmark risk-free liquid investment. That is a government bond, right? So look at US Treasury, look at Canadian government bond, look at European government bonds. They now issue a yield. They now offer a yield which is much higher than it was a year ago. 
So when all these foreign buyers were, were purchasing all these Canadian properties, all these Australian properties, US properties, that's also because their domestic risk-free alternative was not yielding much. And nowadays I can buy a US treasury at 3%. Now, of course, that changes my appetite to go in and buy all these Australian and Canadian properties because mortgage rates are much higher and my alternative as well, which is my domestic government, bond, offers a pretty decent yield. That is important. I want to talk to you about some uh, key sectors now. I want to look at copper and uh, the ags with you. You know, copper, which we know is seen as the economic barometer, um, down 12%, uh, whereas uh, ags looking quite bullish here. What, what's your take on these two spaces? So it's very interesting to compare these two commodities. I did that again uh, on the Macro Compass in one of my analyses. And I looked at copper exactly against an index that tracks 12 agricultural commodities. And throughout 2020 and up until the end of 2021, what happened, Daniela, is that both moved in sync. Mm -hmm. So the demand was picking up. It was boosted by large fiscal stimulus, by banks lending because the government was guaranteeing their losses in case, you know, people would go belly up. So the private sector had a lot of pent up demand to spend. And at the same time, we had some supply issues. So every commodity straight up, one line up. We, uh, we then reached the end of 2021 and you start to see this divergence that you highlighted, where copper, which is the bellwether for industrial demand across the world, copper has started to wobble a bit. It's, you know, down 10 to 12 percent, as you said, over the last month. But look at agricultural commodities. They don't stop going up. So why is that? Copper is a, is a commodity that depends on global demand. And as we highlighted, global demand is slowing down also as a result of central banks tightening across the globe. It's mm -hmm. not only the US, but it's every central bank. They're making sure that we have less purchasing power, less buoyant aggregate demand to throw to the economy. So a commodity that is highly dependent from that, like copper, takes a hit. But agricultural commodities, whatever is the condition we got to eat, and so as those are more necessities for us than discretionary uh, choices, we still have a, a relatively inelastic demand and the supply is hampered big times. So look at the Russia-Ukraine war. I mean, wheat, they are the, the two countries that are responsible for more than 25% of global exports of wheat. They basically can't produce any. They're doing, they're doing a war. And now you have India saying, well, everything we produce, sorry guys, we can't export. So you compress the supply, which makes prices go up and they don't stop going up. So, so Alf, what, do you, what, what is an investor to do here? Like, it's an environment where nothing is safe. I mean, should I be getting into to ags then? Yeah, so this is uh, what I call on the, on the macro compass, my um, four quadrant asset allocation model. We are in the quadrant that I call there is nowhere to hide effectively, unfortunately, because global demand is slowing down, central banks are tightening at the same time. Oh my God, I mean, this is not a friendly environment at all. So you can choose some defenders in your portfolio. You remember in our last interviews, I said, raise your cash allocation, buy some dollars, be more defensive, because to be honest, there is no place where to hide. And I hope, you know, that worked pretty well and it is still my stance. If you believe that inflation is here to stay or to slow down less than central banks expect, then it's going to get worse for stocks, worse for bonds, worse for gold, worse for Bitcoin. The thing that can hold up your portfolio is commodities that are stuck in a very tight supply regime. So that can be oil, that can be agricultural commodities, that could work. Why worse for gold, Alf? If you look at it, you know, compared to Bitcoin, S&P, it's one of the best performing assets of 2022. So gold is holding uh, pretty okay, as I highlighted last time as well, but it's still not delivering a major performance, especially adjusted for inflation, Daniela. We know that gold is supposed over the very long term to preserve the purchasing power, at least, right, of, of our savings. And this year isn't achieving that result. So why is that the case? That is the case because gold is driven by real interest rates mostly. And while inflation is very high spot today, the inflation expectations over the next five years are around about 3%. But nominal yields have gone up much faster this year because the Federal Reserve is all of a sudden serious about fighting inflation. And as they want to slow down the economy, they want to push real yields higher so that our borrowing costs are higher. When that happens, you give investors 
a very safe alternative, which is treasury bonds at a decent real yields, and gold becomes tactically a bit less attractive. Okay, but make the case, why am I not better off being in gold than having cash in the bank with these inflationary times where I'm actually losing money? Make the case, why yeah. wouldn't I be in gold versus the cash in the bank? So the, the situation is that with the cash in the bank, effectively you're guaranteed to lose about this year, let's say on average 5%. If we assume inflation at the end of the year is going to be 4 to 5 percent, that's what the market believes, then in 2022, you're going to lose 4 to 5 percent. Now, gold tends to track inflation over very long periods of time, Daniela. But there are cycles in the market where if real interest rates are going up very fast, temporarily gold can underperform inflation. That's what we are seeing right now in the first few months of the year. It's a sentiment thing. It's because you're offering investors the possibility to buy treasuries. Remember, we, we discussed it in the past. Bank deposits are one way, one benchmark, but it's an unsecured risk on a bank. So people normally would take that money away and they will try at least to buy treasuries. They yield a bit better and treasuries are the liability of the government, not of commercial banks. So that should be your benchmark. I just want to get a question in here about crypto since we have a lot of uh, crypto investors who watch this program, Alf. Uh, is it a crypto winter? Uh, you know, if we focus on Bitcoin, is it going to be more pain Will it turn it around? What's your take? What are you seeing? I was, so again, I don't want to come across as a perma bear. I am not, I have a, <laughs> I have a macro model. I look at a lot of, of indicators and there are cycles. There is a moment to, a friend of mine in a hedge fund would say, Alf, there is a time to go long, a time to go short and a time to go fishing where you have no idea, right? So there were a time where I was long and more buoyant and now it's time to be defensive guys. And is crypto, uh, belonging into a defensive portfolio. Unfortunately, it's not. It is a, an asset class that benefits from strong risk sentiment. And right now there is all but strong risk sentiment. And on the macro compass, I've been pretty clear about that. I, I actually see Bitcoin, uh, I think in November, 2021, I released an article talking about Bitcoin going to 26,000. Back then it was 55 or so. People thought right. that was crazy, but it's just part of the cycle, Daniela. Okay, final thoughts. Bring it home for us. You're not a perma, perma bear, you said, uh, but for our viewers watching, uh, what would you like them to know? Take it home for us. So I would like people to understand that we are in a part of the cycle where central banks are committed in slowing down inflation. They will not stop tightening financial conditions and making asset prices go down unless they achieve the objective. There is no Fed put. They are not in a condition to rescue markets and therefore I would advise people to be defensive, to raise cash allocations, to raise exposure to the dollar, buy some volatility protection, be defensive in your choices. There are moments to be buoyant. This is not one of them. Alf, uh, I always enjoy speaking with you. You're a lot of fun to follow on Twitter. He will come after you though if you cut your spaghetti with a knife. Oh I yes. Oh, yes, I will. Mm -hmm. And also, if you drink cappuccino after 11 a.m., it's a crime against humanity. Don't do it. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, Alf. Uh, come back soon. Okay. I will. Thanks, Daniela. Okay. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more for you coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to Stansberry Research. And don't forget to sign up at DanielaCambone.com to be on top of all the latest interviews coming your way. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.